Great. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, you know, first of all, thanks everyone for joining us. You know, uh, this is an event we've been looking forward to with some great panelists. Uh, we're going to be talking today about, you know, broadband deployment and government owned networks and how that fits into the equation. Uh, so we got a great panel. So starting off, we have Chip Baltimore, who's a senior fellow with the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. Uh, we have Whitney Klasna, a board member of the Rural Agricultural Council of America and has the best Zoom background I think I've seen yet. Uh, and then finally, we've got Larry Spywack, the uh, president of the Phoenix Center for Advanced Legal and Economic Public Policy Studies. Um, so obviously today we're gonna talk a little bit about deployment and how government owned networks can affect the incentives for private companies to deploy. But I think it's important to start off with a baseline of why we understand that, that getting broadband to Americans is, is an important thing. Uh, so to start off, uh, you know, I'd really like to talk about um, why broadband is so important to you and your work. And I want to bring this into all the panelists. Obviously, we have a lot of different backgrounds here and a lot of different uh, use cases. I guess we can start with Whitney and, and take it from there. Yeah. So my name is Whitney Klasna, and I farm and ranch in the middle of nowhere, Montana. Um, broadband is non-existent out here. In fact, my internet is so poor in my house that I have to drive out to my cow pasture to get enough cell service to get on a Zoom call. So um, I apologize for my uh, co-workers if they do a drive-by on my window. <laughs> um, yeah, so I live in rural Northeast Montana. Um, we're kind of in a, a great um, kind of wide open prairie country. Um, we have oil and gas in our area but we farm and ranch full time uh, with my husband, Dylan and his parents, Tim and Kim. And then I also serve as the national secretary of the United States Cattlemen's Association and do um, work with the RACA organization as well. But as far as um, broadband, it's very essential for us out here. We're also rural firefighters um, and getting accurate information on weather and wind is um, key to it. So. We're hoping that um, we can get some expansion into our area because we're kind of considered the last mile um, when it comes to, um, you know, the connectivity and getting that last mile connected. So that's kind of a little bit about that. Um, I'd be happy to answer any more questions. Great. And, and, and Chip, I know you've been working with some of these communities across the country on, on broadband deployment. Can you talk a little about, about what you've been seeing and, and kind of how, what you've been seeing during uh, all this? Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know, with the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, we've been we've been looking at a lot of different uh, communities throughout the country. Uh, I'm in Iowa. Um, spent the last uh, 25 plus years uh, in a small town, about 13,000 people uh, in Iowa, and served as a state legislator here in Iowa for for eight years of, of that time. And and we see all sorts of of need for for internet connectivity. You know, we, we see precision agriculture. We've got uh, a lot of uh, tractors and combines, planters, uh, and harvesting equipment that uh, is, is hooked up to satellites now and trying to make sure that they, they basically drive themselves. It, the, the day is not far off when massive fields of crops uh, in, in my neck of the woods can be farmed with a joystick and, and a computer. Uh, it really is very, very close to that a lot of times. Uh, but, you know, in, in smaller communities, especially out in the Midwest where we've been, we see, we see the needs for all sorts of things. Uh, healthcare is, is a big one. You know, it, it's hard to get a specialist out to a, a small town that's, you know, three hours or four hours from a larger metropolitan area. So they do a lot of telehealth. And we're seeing a lot of uh, similar uh, need for specialty education products uh, that's all done remotely or online. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where uh, when in smaller communities in more remote areas, the internet is really bridging the gap in terms of just trying to provide services and, and goods out there that, uh, that, that are more common in the urban areas. Great. Thank you. And Larry, I'm curious if you want to jump in here as well, talk a little bit about you know, obviously your work is more on the analytical side of the economics and, and how the, the deployment phase out, but you've probably seen cases of, of, of broadband being used. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts to add here about, you know, where uh, you're I, seeing broadband used now. And I feel kind of bad because I don't do animal husbandry. 
and 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 I, I live in a in a in a suburb of Washington D.C. where where broadband is plentiful. So in a way, I, I feel very guilty talking about this. But I have been studying um, this problem for well over 25 years back when I started up as an attorney back to the FCC back in the early 90s. And what, what I can say, this is a very difficult problem. Uh, and it's a very expensive problem. And we've been trying, and it is not a new problem of what we are trying to, to figure out here. The economics are what the economics are on this. Uh, we are a very big country, uh, a lot of wide open spaces very diverse country with different um, demographics, which leads to very different demand portfolios. Um, and so, it, like I said, it is a very difficult problem. And um, there's a willingness to solve it up to a degree. You know, at, at some point you got to go, okay, well, how much is that, that last home worth? Is it worth $50,000 to measure home? Nobody, nobody's asking that question, but We've been pushing at the edges to make it more and more incremental to do that. And I, um, you know, with with COVID that's come up, broadband has again sort of come up, going, "Gee, this is it's important." Uh, but it is a service; firms supply it, consumers demand it. And so, trying to get an efficient policy that we can make those marginal improvements um, that's that's a tough choice, and th th that's a tough question. Great. Yeah. And I mean, it's definitely a problem that we have to, to address and, and, you know, consider all the costs and, and the benefits of everything. Uh, Whitney, I'd love if you could just jump in a little bit more on some of these challenges that rural communities face. Obviously, as Larry's saying, you know, as we're trying to connect these communities, the, the costs become more increasingly in, like difficult to, to bear and, and to get all these communities connected is going to you know cost a lot of money. But there's also a lot of challenges that these communities face and, and use cases that maybe some of us in, in D.C. might not have considered. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that. Definitely. So our area is serviced by a small rural telephone cooperative and they service an area that's larger than the um, state of Rhode Island and definitely less population. It's probably 30,000 square miles that they service. And, um, you know, it's one of some of the most remote, remote parts of Montana. And during the pandemic, especially when we um, were in distance learning in, in the last spring, we saw a huge um, increase in demand on our rural um, internet that we get and most everywhere out in rural Montana is in a DSL connection and you know our students weren't able to uh, connect via zoom on there because like like me they couldn't connect on zoom in their house because um, they didn't have a strong enough signal so our rural schools were having to run the bus routes backwards and every day and hand out homework because they couldn't um, receive it virtually that way. So it's been a, a huge financial burden um, on our school systems, but also just the burden on our families and our students that we have in our community. Um, that's been a huge issue. And um, as far as running businesses, um, farm and ranch, I mean, we're a lot of us are, you know, million dollar businesses that are trying to operate and have um, up to date market information as well. So, um, you know, it's been very hard in getting that timely information and making business decisions that we need to. Um, some of the other things like I touched on earlier was being a rural firefighter. Um, a lot of the times we don't even have cell phone signal um, where we're going or, or even on some of the county roads that we're on. So um, we're hoping that um, we can get some small cell 5G deployment that we can add to our firefighting rigs that we are able to have um, cell phone signal there so we can communicate with um, other fire, rural firefighters and other, um, other um, agencies as well to mitigate any um, further damage from massive prairie fires. So, yeah. Great. And, and I think, Larry, I'd like to, to bring you back in for a, a second here as well. You know, we, we've talked a lot about the importance of broadband so far, but there's also a, lot, a big constituency of Americans that don't subscribe to broadband that do have access to it and maybe could afford it. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that and maybe whether the, the pandemic's kind of changing that view of relevance. Is it changing that view of relevancy for, for consumers? Um, well, in fact, uh, 
our, our chief economist, George Ford, actually just got a paper published in a refereed academic journal on, on this very topic. Uh, it's, it's going to be forthcoming. I mean, the problem is, is that it's not that people don't want it. It's, it's a question of when you hear people going, it's not affordable. What does affordability mean? It's a willingness to pay. And what we've discovered is in a lot of these surveys, um, the number one reason why a lot of people say, you know, do you want the internet? It's a question of relevancy. Um, as I like to joke, I mean, again, this isn't my first rodeo. I remember when we did the 2012 broadband plan and everybody's like, well, we want 100% penetration. I said, well, what do you do about the Amish, right? The Amish don't want broadband. Um, and a lot of people, you know, in a lot of areas, they don't want porn in their house. They got it on their phone. They don't need to work, you know, getting emails. You know, again, how much is enough? Um, and so what, what we discovered though, is that when you hear about affordability, people are using the price point as a, um, as a justification for spending millions. And what we discovered is if you look at the surveys, they took out the question of relevancy and just made it price. So the number one answer is why don't you use the internet? Relevancy was taken out. And so price naturally comes up to the top. But affordability though is, is willingness to pay. Um, you know, I, I wish I could afford a Rolls Royce, I can't. So you, you get into that debate and, you know, and then you get into the debate of the broader universal service issue, which is, is long going, which is, you know, how much is enough? Um, and that's another paper we just did, and, you know, how to organize, you know, the lifeline program, for example, like, you know, if you offer a reduced service at a reduced price, you know, you only want to make it so the people who need it get that, otherwise everybody will buy the cheaper product. Right, so you, you get into these debates over all that kind of issue, but um, you know some people still don't want it, some people do. But it's an issue of when you start making the argument that it's quote not affordable, affordability is an issue of of willingness to pay, and we need to be very very careful because where I think that could go, not that I want to get too astray, but um, you know the Democrats have passed the bill about a year ago and they wanted to set up an office an NTIA where everybody would file their competitive prices and they would decide what is affordable. And that is rate making without the due process of a tariff. So we need to be very, very careful about when you start hearing these phrases going around that we, you know, you start getting into rate making, you have the Fifth Amendment of the, of the uh, Constitution to pay attention to. And so these are just little things we like to point out. Great. And Chip, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that as well, just on the broader topic of, of broadband during the pandemic and kind of how you've seen uh, the, the stay at home orders affecting, you know, use and, and relevancy. Yeah, uh, we, we've seen it all over, uh, much like the rest of the country, especially with education, uh, you know, schools either being, you know, from home only or a hybrid model. Uh, you know, so the schools have definitely been been important there. I'm, I'm an attorney, uh, so I, I practice law, and our court systems have been, you know, shut down here in Iowa with jury trials and in-person hearings have all been either delayed or uh, you know converted to some kind of virtual video, just, you know, streaming video thing. So, uh, so that's that's been uh, certainly something that's that's very very important here. I, I've represented a number of healthcare professionals that are really trying to especially screen patients uh, for their preliminary uh, visits to determine whether or not they really need to see them in person or not. And, and that's, that's been a, a, a crucial thing. Um, you know, we, we've got a number of uh, small businesses, uh, especially like restaurants that are doing takeout only, but everything it went plastic. Uh, you know, and they were, a lot of them were not handling any cash. And so with the plastic part comes, you know, you've got to have that con connectivity to process the transactions. And so that, you know, I think it's just, it's becoming, it's, it's accelerating in my opinion, the, the pandemic is accelerating uh, the adoption of technology and online services, um, you know, faster than it probably would have organically without, without the pandemic. Great. Well, I think I'm going to move us on a little bit to talk about, you know, actually ways of promoting broadband. If, if we're going to take it for a, 
take it as, a, as an assumption that we do want to try to incentivize or help facilitate the deployment of broadband. Um, what are the, the best ways of, of doing that? And I think this, just, just to start us off, is going to be kind of a broad, open question of, to all the panelists. You know, assuming that this is something we want to encourage, how should we go about doing so? Um, if anyone wants to jump in. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start very quickly. You know, during my years in the state legislature, one of the first things that we did, and this was, what, four, four years ago, I believe it was, um, you know, fiber and, and, and coax cable, all the stuff that's in the ground um, was taxed as, as part of property tax system. Uh, and, and we made that, you know, tax exempt, simply to try to make the cost of installing uh, fiber, coax, whatever you decided to, to, to install to get your, your trunks out there and your lines out there, try to make that as cheap uh, as possible uh, to install and then to continue to operate. So that was, that was one tool that we used we thought was, was very helpful here in Iowa. And it did spur a lot of investment from especially the private sector uh, to go forward and do that. But the other things that we've seen have been helpful are uh, for smaller communities, especially, you know, freeing up their, their rights of way. So that uh, makes it, you know, you know, very simple permitting process. Don't charge an arm and a leg to, to get into the government owned rights of way in order to do that. Uh, and then we've seen some other things in some of the growing areas um, where you're starting to see some growth in terms of encouraging uh, through your local ordinances uh, requirements that uh, developers have, you know, install conduit or some kind of, uh, of uh, infrastructure to facilitate, you know, this kind of, uh, of activity. Great. And, and I'd love to jump in if I could take my little moderator's privilege here and actually make a point. Um, because you touched on a lot of the right of ways, the, the basically a dig once is, is kind of what you're referring to with the conduit into mm -hmm. the ground. Um, this is something that our street's been, you know, working on a lot ever since, you know, I've started here and we put out an annual broadband scorecard is what we call it, where we're ranking every state on their uh, laws that facilitate, you know, access to rights of way, whether the permitting is subject to like a shot clock or whether there's a fee cap to what uh, a locality could charge for review of that permit application, or maybe if these fees that they charge are have to be cost based. So basically they can't just use this as a source for generating revenue, but instead, um, limit it to the cost of actually reviewing these permits. But a lot of this talk has kind of come in the context of 5G because obviously the, the 5G networks are going to be denser. So they're going to have the, what they call small wireless facilities and, and they're going to need a lot more of them. So the, the work at the FCC, a lot of it has focused on some of these uh, small cell deployments, getting access to right away for these. But there's also you know more broader reforms that we can be doing for telecom infrastructure generally. And it's important not to forget that there's still a lot of wires in the ground that even facilitate you know, a lot of these 5G networks, a lot of these franchise uh, agreements that, that some of the cable companies have might be a little outdated. And, um, you know, there's just a lot of different factors that go into it. You mentioned dig once. I think that's another really important policy that we try to calculate on our scorecard. And, and you know, we give a very broad definition of what dig once could be. It could be like notification requirements so that whenever someone's digging up, they notify broadband providers and give them the opportunity to install uh, infrastructure. It could be a conduit that you could wire fiber through. Um, but all these things are, are you know, very important uh, steps that aren't actually imposing or they're not like subsidy programs where we're spending taxpayer money on them. We're just making it easier to, for, for companies to go out and actually get the infrastructure out there. Um, but I think also at the end of the day, it's important to recognize that just simply reforming some of these infrastructure processes aren't it isn't going to make the business case for a lot of communities just all of a sudden become manageable. And, and, you know, like with Whitney, a lot of, you know, those areas, even with good infrastructure laws probably still might not, you know, have the, the business case where there's not enough of consumers to buy the product or the cost of deploying is just too high. I'm, I'm curious if, if, you know, Whitney or Larry want to jump in and have any thoughts about um, deployment, maybe talk a little bit about, how, should we try to, you know, subsidize some of these programs? The FCC just announced their uh, reverse bid, I guess, results from the RDOF program uh, that that was announced earlier this week. It sounds like they had uh, a lot of money granted out to to try to bridge some of these last communities. And I'm curious if you have thoughts on that. Um, well, just real quick, and then unless Whitney, you got something. I mean, you know, your original question was over adoption. Right? Yeah, adoption is a very different 
question than um, very different question than on the supply side, right? I mean, what I don't think what people realize, like when they did the Recovery Act in 2008, we spent about 4.2, 4.5, forgot the exact number, on broadband adoption, right? Uh, Robert Townsend of Hollywood Shuffle fame got a million dollars to do a video on the benefits of broadband. And we looked at the numbers. It turns out that the, you know, the statistical effect of all that money was zero, right? So, you know, the problem is always with broadband adoption, if you're talking like to the schools, you got to get kids computers, right? And the problem is in a lot of areas, and uh, my partner, George, was, was on the Alabama task force, you know, people would give computers and then the next morning they'd be stolen, right? These, these are real world problems that you have to deal with, um, as opposed to just going, gee, you know, people watch a lot of Netflix. Um, and that's on the adoption side. But I think clearly, you know, if there ever there was an example of uh, an event that showed why broadband is essential, I think it was was COVID. So, you know, I think supply side is there. It's just a question is demand side is there. The question is, is there enough demand to justify the business case? And then you're still getting to the to the important questions of, you know, you know, the whole point of the RDOF auction was for years with universal service, we had subsidized multiple firms, sometimes we even greenfield. So if you're going to subsidize, and I think that's an important element to the discussion is you should subsidize one firm so that, you know, you at least you have one firm serving the market and the hard off was how cheap can you do it? And I thought it was very interesting that um, Elon Musk got a, won a tremendous amount of that for satellite because maybe it was the cheapest way to do it. Now people say, well, that's not 100 gigabits. Well, you know, it, it, it's all about, again, how much is it worth it to get that extra, that last home out to the middle of, of nowhere. And these are these are difficult questions as opposed to curing cancer or something like that, so. Yes, um, well, I know for myself, I don't need a hundred gigabits to run it. I just need, I mean, enough to be able to run a Zoom webinar. <laughs> so <laughs> when my internet is so poor that I can't even open a web page to run a speed test, you know, it's slow. <laughs> so, um, you know, and you talk about Elon Musk and his um, Starlink satellite, you know, that's, um, you know, promising for, um, you know, rural America for, you know, deployment um, out into the middle of nowhere, especially for, uh, people that run like production bull sales. Um, there's video companies that are able to um, take their um, Starlink satellite with them on the road and broadcast um, a satellite to all their customers across the U.S. and across the globe. So that opens up huge opportunities for um, business, um, you know, revenue, more more dollars coming in for our rural America and rural American citizens. So, um, you know, projects like that um, make me really excited, but we've also got, you know, great things happening with our, our rural telephone cooperatives. You know, they, um, they do a lot. They're working on getting um, fiber dug out to all of um, these last mile houses. It just takes them a little bit longer to do it. Uh, my area is scheduled to get it in 2023, I think. And kind of the final for the service area is like in 2026. So we're getting a bit closer on getting fiber out to these last mile um, areas, but that's also not going to cover everyone. And they're hopefully by, you know, that time we'll have some um, better technology to get to um, those really, really, really remote places um, without having to dig fiber um, out there. So um, you know, we've got great, um, great collaboration between our local governments as well as uh, these private businesses and telephone cooperatives and communications to, you know, get uh, broadband and, and high speed internet out to these communities and uh, rural households. Great. Um, just one one quick thing before we move to, to the government owned networks. I'm, I'm curious just to get the panelists thoughts and this is a little off topic, but um, obviously, Larry, you mentioned a little bit about the pandemic, you know, showing, you know, this is obviously a, a kind of extreme case. Do you think that Congress should be moving to, to explore additional temporary relief uh, for maybe low income consumers or maybe even on some of the, I mean, you mentioned the devices and how they're getting stolen, but 
Um, do you think that this is something that we should be exploring or is this just, you know, another balancing act that that's tough to make the right call on? Um, as the old expression goes, once a subsidy is in place, it is almost impossible to remove that subsidy. So they're talking about it in this debate. I think there's one they want, you know, a COVID relief thing. If somebody in your family's lost their job due to COVID, they, 50 bucks a month and the price tag is only $9 billion a year. Um, if the vaccines are really coming out, I don't think that we need that then. Um, you know, we're in a very different place. Um, but, you know, people are, you know, again, they want to throw you know, numbers of, of 100 billion dollars into broadband. I call that Austin Powers money. Um, you know, and again, by way of comparison, when we did BTOP um, in 2008, that was 7.2. That should put things a bit in perspective of what number and what we're trying to do. So there's people want to throw a lot of money around here. And I think we should be very careful because that's not, you know, every American is going to pay that in their taxes. It's a huge, huge number. So we're going past subsidizing, you know, in the mid middle universal service needs its reform, but we're talking a hundred billion dollars. I don't think people, I mean, realize we're throwing that numbers around. So we need to be very careful. And, you know, we learned a lot from the VTOP proposal about where money went and where it really didn't go. In fact, I was just, I was just the other day, I was just, somebody popped up on Facebook, some news story from Upper Buffalo. Don't ask me why it was on my Facebook feed, but they had found this huge network of dark fiber that was built as part of BTOP in 2008 that people literally forgot about. It, it's been sitting in the ground dark for 12 years that could have been put to use. So you're just talking a massive amount of, when that kind of money flows around, you have to be very careful. So, you know, Congress, could they expand the schools and the library? You know, there's statutorily constraint on that? Sure. Should we reform universal service? Yes but we need to be very careful. This is a service, you know, um, I still occasionally read books, you know, so there, there's, we have to, again, just be very careful about this. Joke's on you, Larry. I don't even know how to read. No, um, <laughs> Chip, Whitney, do you guys want to jump in on this at all or should we move on? Uh, well, yeah, you know, I, I, I would agree with, with Larry that, um, you know, that one of the more challenging things I always found as a, as a legislator was, um, you know, some perceived need out in the, uh, in the communities. Uh, and the, the gut reaction of a government entity is just throw money at it without a plan or a detailed plan about how it's going to be spent, you know, on what, what kind of parameters are you going to have? And I, and I think we're seeing a lot of that in the COVID world now with you know the federal government and a lot of states just trying to help everybody as much as they possibly can and they throw a bunch of money at it and then you know the programs aren't set up well uh and and the the implementation is not thought all the way through and i think that's one of the biggest worries that i would have is you're just going to be throwing a bunch of money at, at something and it's not a very in my opinion efficient way of addressing the specific problems that you're looking at. And Whitney, do you want to jump in or should I just take us on? No, oh, I agree with what Chip and Larry said, definitely. Well, I, I think I'll also just make a plug for the importance of mapping here as well. I think Larry was kind of hinting at that at, at times. It's just like, you don't want to be wasting money on, on places that are already served. And that's why getting accurate maps is also probably a important task that we should uh, be thinking about as well. It's actually, if I can just jump in, it's oh, actually, feel free. actually more than that. I mean, if you look at BTOP, they had this money. They didn't have maps, which was also a problem, but they took the money, they gave the money in before they had the maps, but then they also conditioned the money, right? So they conditioned the money on open internet things. So the major players who could have built out that last mile cheaper due to their spillover effects, they shied away. So you had these guys going, I'll build a greenfield network. I mean, it was a total boondoggle and waste of, dare I say, $7.2 billion. And that was just 7.2, not $100 billion. So th there's all these kind of problems that go with that. Great. And uh, just a reminder for the 
people in the audience, if you have any questions for our panelists, so we'll have a little bit of time at the end for some Q&A. So feel free to get those down in the uh, Q&A section. Um, so I'm going to move us now to kind of the, the meat of the discussion here, which is the, the government-owned networks and how they factor into um, the deployment of broadband and obviously the incentives that, that they do or do not create for, for private companies. And, and Larry, I want to start us off with you. Uh, you just wrote a great paper. And, uh, you know, to, to be clear, it, it, you, you came, kind of came out and said, look, this is not for or against muni broadband. This is just an economic study of, or, you know, a study of the processes. What do they work? Do they not work? I'd love it if you could, you know, talk a little bit about that paper and, you know, what that means for, for the, the market and how government owned networks kind of affect the, the, the business case for deployment. Sure. Thanks. Um, well, it's, it's, a paper that covers the law and economics of municipal broadband. So it's appropriately titled The Law and Economics of Municipal Broadband. It was just published in the Federal Communications Law Journal. Um, and it's a massive piece. It's about 100 pages. Um, there's a lot that goes into this, to this debate. And, um, you know, it's important, you know, when you start talking about municipal, a lot of people have different reasons for municipal broadband. And again, it's, it's not that we're opposed or against, I think you need to do it. And so municipal broadband is a very different, you know, if you're, you're living up where Whitney's living and there's nobody else going to enter, because, you know, why do you have municipal broadband? The answer is usually because nobody else will go in, right? If it's profitable, private firm is going to go in. So you have that issue there. But a lot of times municipal broadband will then come in and, you know, most notable Chattanooga, where you already have several other providers. Um, and so the, the issues are very separate. So you have legal issues of preemption and Fifth Amendment due process. But first, let's just talk about the economics of it. Um, as the first part of our conversation reveals, this is a very expensive and very difficult business, uh, even in the best of circumstances. And so the real issue with municipal broadband, and in particular, the state municipal broadband laws, which tend to be the focus of the debate, is all about stopping the cross subsidization because uh, that's really the magic thing because telecom is very expensive um, and particularly if there's another firm involved but a lot of these municipal broadband networks tend to come out out of when there's also municipal uh, electric network and so there you've got captive customers because it's usually a monopoly and so most of these laws are designed to stop the subsidy from the captive rate payers, or in some cases like up in Vermont, uh, general revenues from going to subsidize the broadband business. And the problem is when the government starts subsidizing, um, and by the way, that's not the only form of subsidization, just going back again, back to BTOP, Chattanooga got something like $400 million allegedly to build smart grids. And it said they built the fiber network, right? So that was not just subsidy from the electric utility in Chattanooga, that was a subsidy from all Americans to Chattanooga. Um, so the issue there is really the cross subsidization problem of um, you're robbing Peter to keep Paul alive, so to speak. And if you're competing against the private sector, you just can't do that. Um, meaning, in other words, the private sector can't survive. What people we did a paper years ago and we, we recited again in this paper, there's an equilibrium number of firms in every market. Um, that equilibrium number tends to be small, but it is a function of the economics. It is not a political choice, right? You know, the market can sustain two firms, then you got two firms. You put a third firm in there, somebody's gonna go bust or they're just gonna let their network wither and die. And so the issue, what we go through is the economics of one, the issue of cross subsidization in this case, what we found is it really is just when you have that kind of government uh, subsidy, it's really, it's, it's predatory, quite frankly, it's predatory entry because it is so far below cost that absent the subsidies, you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, so you're not competing with the private sector. You're anti-competitively competing against the private sector due to these, uh, this predatory subsidy. Um, so most likely you're gonna drive somebody out. Uh, we've also looked a lot of times when people talk, you were, you were asking about the benefits of broadband. Um, you know, a lot of times people build, cities build broadband networks, and if you phrase it in the terms of economic development, and that's just, you know, that's fairy dust and magic for your local politician. Costs are irrelevant. We're going to bring jobs. 
And we looked at some of the, the literature, we looked at, um, you know, Chattanooga was a big one. And it turns out that, you know, yes, they built a broadband network, but there was also a Volkswagen plant. So where did the jobs come from, the Volkswagen plant or that? And it turns out that there was no statistical effects. I mean, essentially the jobs that it created were like, you know, four or five, which was just the people running the network. So you don't have the jobs effect. Um, and you don't really have the investment. If anything, you're sort of business stealing. And then you get to the whole legal issue with that, um, which is, you know, state laws have been going, look, I want to make sure that captive rate payers or um, bondholders are ne not left on, the, on holding the bag for municipal broadband. I mean, a lot of the municipal broadband laws, they let uh, the munis, you know, do their thing. And many have been doing stuff for years. But when they try to, for example, get out of their core territory and expand into other places, again, you've got this predatory element. And then I think the most thing is, is again, when you're competing against a private firm, and this is really sort of where the network is. So you're not providing competition. You've got, you've, you've got subsidized uh, predatory entry. And there was an interesting case at the DC circuit a couple of years ago that believe it or not dealt with the railroads. And what the DC circuit said is that when the government acts as both a regulator and competitor, that violates the fifth amendment uh, uh, due process protections. Uh, nobody's ever brought that case. I wish they would, um, but this is a highly political business. So again, it's not being against it. You know, a lot of times people, when they talk about municipal broadband, it's like they're all failures and they are failures mainly because they can't keep getting these subsidies. They get caught or, you know, the electric utility people are going, I can't keep paying for this. And that's the problem or the federal subsidies don't show up anymore. And that's just an inherent problem to those are the big problems with municipal broadband. And again, it's available on our website, www.phoenix-center.org. There you go. So, so uh, just before we move on, I'm, I'm a little curious, how did, how did they get the subsidy for the electric grid and able to use that to build a telecom network? Were there not enough like restrictions in the law or like, how did that happen? I just curious. Uh, I'm not sure, but they did it. <laughs> I can, they, I they can tell you. I mean, it's, it's in their financials. You know, they listed as they claim five. I mean, a lot of times you have uh, there's a phrase in electric utilities, joint and common costs. Um, so you know, you can sort of mix and match it. And don't forget, the municipalities are not um, they're not regulated by the local PUCs. They're sort of self-regulated, and that's where the, why they get away without the lack of oversight. I can tell you how they're doing it in Iowa because you know in Iowa the only uh, successful economically feasible sustainable municipal broadband systems also have a municipal electric utility that's a monopoly and they're they're abusing their monopoly power in the electric utility and the way they're doing it now is come in and say that the electric utility wants access to this broadband system to do smart metering uh, and, and operate their, their electric grid and regulate that. And so that's how they get around the anti-cross subsidization provisions under Iowa law. They say, well, they're actually getting a, a, a service from this broadband system because they're going to, at some point down the road, go to these smart meters. And so what we've seen here is uh, that the consultants primarily that are designing these systems and, and, and recommending them to, to the uh, local governments uh, are coming in and, and saying, you can get your electric utility to pay 30, 40, up to 50% of the cost of installing this system if you do it this way. Um, and and then, then you see the intrafund loans you see the electric utility, if these electric utilities are monopolies, which they almost always are, they have huge reserves and they will loan the uh, telecom utility millions of dollars to fund their half up. We saw a situation in Muscatine, Iowa, where that happened. And because the municipal uh, telecom utility was not economically sustainable over the years, uh, out of a $31 million loan from the electric utility to the telecom utility, um, they had to turn around and forgive 25 million of it. That's $25 million that the electric rate payers ate. 
uh, in terms of, of overpaying for their electric, electricity year after year after year, building up these reserves and they ate it. And the key is, from, from my perspective, nobody knows it. All of this is done in the, in the electric utility or the telecom utility board meetings. Nobody goes to those things. Nobody pays attention. Nobody knows how their electricity rates are calculated, but they're overpaying. And they're overpay on their electric rates to fund this back channel stuff. And, and that's how they get around all these different laws there. Uh, that's, that's a problem. And it's, it's a problem on the ground. Uh, and it, it really comes down to, in my opinion, an abuse of the monopoly power of the electric utilities. And we, we Larry, I know you, you, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say uh, exactly what Chip was saying. In fact, in the paper, um, our chief economist, George Ford, did a thing with uh, Opelaka, um, Alabama. And it's hard to get the financials for these guys. Chip is absolutely right. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Um, and George got the Opelaka. Um, I mean, it, it was just filthy. And then they ended up selling the system, I think, for like, you know, a dollar or something, you know, whatever it was eventually. But it was, you hit it right on the head, Chip. I'm sorry, go ahead, Whitney. Okay, uh, so so one thing you know Larry had mentioned is is that you know a lot of the times that this is not really competitive for uh, the the firms that already exist in that market and and you know Chip I, I want to turn to you now for something that TPA the Taxpayers Protection Alliance has been working on um, you know th there was a case in Lucas Texas that you guys got involved in uh, at least yeah. as I understand it that already had some firms that existed and they wanted to pass a ballot initiative to start another muni network I know. Uh, you guys got heavily involved in this. I'm curious if you could talk about this issue, how it came to your attention and, and you know, why you all got involved, kind of what happened there. Sure. You know, we, we got involved because a local resident was opposed to the, to the concept of a municipal broadband system there and it was looking out on the uh, internet for, for help and for resources to, to help in terms of information and also advice about you know, what's going on, what should be red flags to look for in this, in this, um, in this referendum uh, that was going up on the ballot down there. So you know, we, we looked into that situation. It turned out to be a lot like uh, many of the other situations that we see, um, very consultant driven. The consultants were driving the business plan, driving the, the business model. And, and in Lucas, Texas, they had you know, several other incumbent providers already. Um, they, some were wireless, some were, were wired, uh, some were fiber. Uh, and, and so they had, they had competition already. But what we were really concerned about was the, the, the concept that in order for a municipal broadband uh, entity to work there, they really would have to drive out all the competition. When you sat down and crunched the numbers based upon the cost of, of construction per, per home or per residence that you're, you're passing, uh, it was about double what we saw in a lot of other areas. Uh, they, they were trying a business model where their, their uh, rates were going to be significantly higher than the incumbent rates that, that were there. They were going to have to borrow uh, tens of millions of dollars from the local taxpayers um, in order to, uh, to, to fund this system. So the economics just simply were not feasible. Uh, we assisted uh, down there by doing a series of, of uh, short videos, just kind of breaking down certain warning uh, areas uh, of these municipal broadband systems, provided some data and some materials and some studies that, uh, that we had engaged uh, to be done that kind of led to providing support in, at the grassroots level for, for the op opponents down there and the, uh, the, the referendum failed, uh, fortunately. But uh, we didn't have a lot of time and that's one of the bigger dangers of these things is a lot of times with the consultants and the proponents of these systems, they're working behind the scenes and there's not a lot of transparency in terms of what they're doing. Um, and then all of a sudden they spring a vote uh, out there on, on the citizens and promote the good stuff. And the good stuff is, hey, it's going to be you know, local control, excellent customer service, competitive rates, even though they don't tell you that competitive may be more than what you're paying right now. 
but it, in, in my opinion, and in, in Texas, Lucas, Texas, this is the same thing. The consultants did this study to show the support in the community, but what they never asked was, you know, are how much are you willing to pay? And I think Larry kind of referenced the affordability part. It's, it's what are you willing to pay for the the internet service that you want? And I don't think that in Lucas there were enough people that really were willing to pay what they were promoting in terms of the price there. Great. And Whitney, if I could, I'd love to turn to you here for a little bit. Um, you know, you've explained this already, but, you know, rural communities often struggle to receive, you know, necessary connections to, to realize the benefits of the modern internet. But at the same time, uni networks are often rooted in specific communities that aren't necessarily these rural areas and, and that may already have existing competitors. And as, you know, Larry and Chip have explained, there's, you know, a tax cost to that. And, and there's a lot of potential losses to these communities that could be felt by everyone in the state. And I'm curious if, if you uh, have any thoughts about how some of these muni networks uh, affect rural deployments and rural communities. Well, I think for the simple fact is um, we don't have enough people for out other companies to come in and, and be able to compete. Um, that way it's difficult to attract um, more competition to the marketplace. But we've been seeing it already with uh, satellite internet providers, um, granted, most often they um, overpromise and underperform on a lot of their um, promises of connectivity and, and speeds and everything. So a lot of people revert back to, um, you know, the provider that they originally had and sometimes end up paying a bit more, but when it's a reliable network, um, that kind of means more. But with um, more competition coming in with Starlink satellite um, and other, now we're starting to finally see um, a little more competition coming into the area of um, expanding uh, high-speed internet to these areas. Um, I think we're we're going to see a lot more benefits to these rural communities, and especially, um, you know, we have a lot of low-income. Um, communities in, in rural America. So I think we're going to see some benefits coming um, back into those areas. And, and hey, Jeff, last on, on kind of this, this, yeah, go for, go for it, Larry. You no, know, Wendy makes a really interesting point that I think bears highlighting here. Um, it's interesting. You have these guys come in and promise the moon and the stars. Taxpayers are then on the hook for it. They build out, it turns out it's a really bad service and you go back to what's tried and true and, and, and you lose that. One of, the, one of the points that I think bears watching as we're about to spend a hundred billion dollars with what this is, this is really important. I mean, the issue over municipal broadband, you know, maybe the wise people in Montana, um, and I have friends in Montana, uh, you know, the states will pass a legislature designed to protect this, right? That's what the whole fight over muni broadband really is about, it's these state laws. Now, just putting on my lawyers half a minute, that's already gone to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has held, because they tried to get injunctive relief, uh, excuse me, preemptive relief from both the FCC and they've tried to get Congress to do it. Um, and the Supreme Court has held in the case called Nixon versus Missouri Municipal Leagues, that the federal government has no business telling a state what it can do with its municipal subdivisions, okay? That was a very big case. Um, but again, going back to the Democrats' infrastructure bill, they have an, I don't most people realize this, they have an exceedingly broad preemption provision in there that would essentially ban every single state law that tries to oversee municipal subdivisions and also gives them, at the same time, encourage them to compete against the private sector. I don't think people realize this, but this is what is being proposed and you need to keep your eyes on that. Now, would that provision eventually go up to the court and uh, be overturned? Could be, but you know, a lot of eggs would be scrambled in the meantime for that. Something to keep your eyes out on. Well, I mean, obviously, as we've talked about, there are definitely some very serious drawbacks, but, you know, obviously in some of the rural areas, communities still try, trying to get coverage and, you know, folks around the country still want um, more deployment. Are there ways that local governments can work with private industry to uh, bring broadband to their communities? Are there, you know, good examples of this working or has this mainly been uh, some poor examples? Or... It, it's been my experience that the cities actually have been rather recalcitrant, which over the years which is, and the states as well, which is, 
even though there is, you know, many things in the law talking about, you know, joint federal cooperation, but the cities have been exceedingly recalcitrant in terms of siting authority, which has resulted in, uh, in franchise reform, cable franchise reform. Um, I just did in full disclosure. I think Jeff, actually, you signed off on that brief. I, mean, I, I was the lead counsel on a brief on the California net neutrality law, which actually seeks to even go beyond the federal law. Um, so, you know, the, the issue with this, and this has been a big issue with, with telecom, we don't want to see, you know, at the state level, death by 50 cuts. Um, and certainly that exacerbate that on the county and civil level. Um, and for years, you know, the, you've always heard, oh, we want that, we want more broadband. And then you just constantly see problems with siting authority and, you know, digging authority. And, and, that, and that's just, it's just the cost of entry. And going back to your issue about municipal broadband, you know, you're both regulator and competitor. So when, you know, your competitor controls, you know, you're not just competing against City Hall, City Hall is regulating you. It controls it. You want to put up a tower? Talk to City Hall. You want to dig a street? Talk to City Hall. Um, you know, fees for, for easements? Talk to City Hall. Um, so the ability to raise your rival's costs here is tremendous with municipal broadband. Um, so there's no really answer there, but as um, I think Chip pointed out, the the industry of the consultants is very hard to uh, dissuade because people just go, "This is terrific, woohoo!" And you know, they promise unicorns and rainbows. And um, in the meantime, people need this stuff, and um, they forget it's a very hard and very expensive business to be in. Any other thoughts on this specific question? So I've got one more question before we turn it over to some of these audience questions. Um, and, and this is mainly for Larry, because I feel like we had talked about this at some point in the past, and I just thought it was an interesting insight. But we've seen heard some talk about a nationalized 5G network. Do some of the same, you know, economic principles and logics of cross subsidization and, and you know, competing against existing industry, does that translate to, to this kind of nationalized 5G topic? Um, well, that's a complicated question. Just by way of background, there is talk, the, the Department of Defense about a month ago put out um, an inquiry about, the, about starting up some sort of using spectrum sharing for uh, create their own 5G network. Uh, to be honest with you, it's an exceedingly vague uh, ROI. But what I, in fact, I, I did something for the Federal Society on this. I mean, what we think it means, what we think it means is that the, um, the Department of Defense would essentially give 450 megahertz of prime mid-band spectrum and then somebody would come in and allegedly build a greenfield network um, and use that spectrum. So all the cost of getting prime license, essentially licensed spectrum, I suppose unlicensed spectrum at no cost would be a huge advantage. You still get back to that equilibrium question that I said. You know, if the equilibrium, we just had a merger of T-Mobile and Sprint because maybe four firms was too many in the market. Um, you know, the, 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 the equilibrium is a function of the size of the market, the intensity of price competition, the amount of sunk costs. It's a very expensive business. Few firms will be the rule. Um, so I would think that if somebody were to come in and do that, um, yes, that would definitely have an adverse effect on people's ability to compete. Because if you have one more firm than what the equilibrium can sustain, somebody's going to somebody's not going to invest in a network or just no, you know that. So that's going to happen. So yeah, the economic principles very much apply to that. Plus, I think the general inequities of we've raised billions of dollars in spectrum and just giving it away perhaps as a, as a uh, defensive move so that they don't have to worry about auctioning it off because they would, I guess, retain, you know, rights to use it. Um, so I, I don't think it's a very good idea. Great. Well, we're running a little low on time, so I'm going to try to turn to some audience questions now. Um, I think this, this first one I, I have some thoughts on, but I'll open it up to everybody first. Uh, the question is just, can you talk a little bit about the pros and cons of different broadband technologies and specifically looking at the rural areas? And I know, Whitney, you touched on this a little bit with satellite, but obviously they, they, they mentioned fixed versus fiber and wireless versus satellite. But the question at the end, I, I think, is one I have thoughts on, which is what should the criteria be for deciding what makes the most sense for a particular community? And my one answer would be the market, but I'll open it up to everybody else on the, on the panel. Well, we did a study on that as well. Uh, a couple of years <laughs> back. 
What happened? Um, you there was, there was a big on, argument on over the definition of we, we got to study on everything. That's what we do. We just sit around and you know <laughs> study. write papers, and <laughs> drink, drink bourbon, smoke cigars. It's a simple life. Um, <laughs> but, but we but we but we actually try to answer that question because um, if you remember, there was a whole argument over what is the minimum definition of a broadband is it 10 one or is it 23 one, whatever it was you know that you know and there was actually a difference from the universal service and it was like, it's not enough and you know it's plenty i mean again it's like the rolling stone songs you may not get what you want but you get what you need um and in fact there was an interesting piece and i'm sure many people saw this in the wall street journal a couple months back where you know the, the argument is actually you're selling me too much i, I don't need that much Right, but you know, it just depends on who you talk to. I mean, how much? I don't have a gigabit, you know. I mean, I mean, how much do I, I, you know, for what I for what I need? So there's all this this talk about it, but I mean, I think the minimum amount, you know, to get it done that that doesn't obviously it sort of rises. I mean, I still remember when you know, two fifty, you know, seven fifty six was considered broadband, and you know, the whole original net neutrality fight was using Skype on your phone because the whole thing would, uh, not Skype, but um. BitTorrent because you, you couldn't control everything there, but you only had 756. We're, we're well past that now, but it's, um, you know, for, for your basic service, and that's what you see with, you know, programs like Internet Essentials, 10.1 is pretty good. It'll run Zoom. You can do your classrooms. Um, yes, you're not running, you know, streaming hundreds of Netflix movies, uh, but you are getting what you need to function to do what you need to do. And this was kind of directed at rural areas. Whitney, I'm curious if you have thoughts about, you know, finding the right technology in, in your communities. Uh, basically, it's whatever works and gets the job done for the least amount of money. That's how <laughs> the market, you know, the market works. You know, we struggle just to um, be able to get services out to our area, even um, getting repairs done. It's, um, you know, will take whoever shows up and does the job correctly. So <laughs> sometimes we end up paying a bit more, but um, you know, as long as it's a reliable, um, you know, reliable source, then, um, you know, we're willing to, I think, to pay a little bit more for it. And Chip, do you have any thoughts or should we, there's one last question here from the audience. Well, just, just very, very briefly, you know, right now, you know, fiber seems to be touted as, you know, the best, uh, you know, technology, but technology changes so quickly uh, in, in this, in this industry that I, I really, I really struggle to, to justify spending and borrowing millions of dollars to put fiber in the ground in some of these remote areas when, 10 years from now, satellite might be just as easy, faster, easier to get. And, and then you've got wasted uh, fiber sitting in the ground that you're still paying for or trying to pay for, and the revenue is just not coming in. So uh, yeah, I think, I think technology is very, very important to take a look at and, and try to predict what the future uh, is going to hold. And, and uh, I'm not uh, enough of a technological wizard to figure that one out. Well, I know Wisp's wireless internet service providers also got a good chunk of that art off money as well. Another potential technology that uh, might play a role in, in some of this. So the final question here is that uh, it says Whitney mentioned she does not need uh, 100 megabits sec uh, per second speed, but we also saw speeds significantly higher than the FCC's minimum benchmark of 25.3. Um, do we need to do more work to figure out what speeds people and particularly small businesses need? Uh, three MBPS uploads seems pretty slow, but uh, I know Larry, you kind of touched on this with your answer already, but anyone want to jump in on that question? Well, I'll just say, um, I'd say oh, I don't. I think you're muted, Whitney. Oh, oh no, never I... mind. There it is. Okay. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. So I say I don't need 100 megabits per second, but also I've never, ever even been on a network that has that fast internet. So sometimes I just don't know what I'm missing. Um, there's so many technologies that we could integrate into our farm and ranch that could make us more efficient and more sustainable if we had um, you know, those wireless technologies that we could 
um, broadcast GPS and um, you know remote remote sensing from our house um, that way. And Chips touched on you know the precision agriculture and so many of that takes um, you know a lot of bandwidth to run. But we just simply have never had the option out here. So a lot of the technologies we don't even realize um, we could be utilizing to make ourselves more sustainable. Um, so yeah, when I say I don't need it, um, that's because I've never even been on it to know what it's like. So <laughs> I struggle to even get um, you know one upload on um, on our network. And we're all basically at time, but Chip, Larry, if you have any last thoughts on this, if not, well, it, I can wrap. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, just just very briefly, I saw I saw some some information lately that uh, a consultant was putting out there that said something like. You know, your your average streaming Netflix show needs you know a half to one megabit per second download speed to to run. I don't know whether that's right or not, but but when you're talking about the the build outs for a lot of these to be up to a gig or even ten gigs now, I think we see in some areas you, the capacity is far exceeding what the you know the average person needs. You know, Whitney could obviously use a little more out there. Uh, but but um, it's it's far in excess, even at you know 100 megabits per second, uh, far in excess of what most people's uh, you know needs are. And and uh, Larry hit it on the head. You know, it's not just what you want; it's what you really need in order to to do what you want to do. Great. Well, I think we're definitely at time here, so I'm I'm going to have to unfortunately wrap this up. But you know, I just want to thank you all for joining joining us. And I want to thank everyone in the audience for coming as well. You know, I thought this was a really interesting discussion and I really appreciate everyone's time. So thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thanks everybody. Whitney, this one's for you. It's kind of a, I feel like bad <laughs> that my background is not uh, oh, no. sufficient for you. So I'm having uh, beef for dinner now, Whitney. Yeah, <laughs> I raised beef, beef cows. <laughs> well, a ship of the meat will be forever grateful. Yes, eat beef. Thank you. <laughs>